It's my privilege to introduce uh, the current elder in a multi-generational uh, family farm operation who really have impressed me with not only their commitment to, uh, to the, su the successful transition to uh, an all-organic operation uh, from a conventional one, but the continued commitment to both improve uh, research and help educate, doing all of it in a really kind and gentle way. And every time I talk with, with Benny or, or Ben or, or Matt, they're all just so gentle-spirited and, uh, and calming on, on an excitable guy like me. So it's, here's Benny. Thank you, Marty. That is uh, quite an honor to hear you say that about our family. So, I am Benny McLean, production manager for Uncle Matt's Organic. Uh, we're in Clermont, which is about 25 miles west of here. I don't know. I know there was the bus was full. There was about 50 participants yesterday in the, in the Grove tour. Uh, we do call it a Grove, Marty. So. Uh, We've been uh, organic for since 1999, and let me just show you real quick. The picture you see up there, that's my dad on the left, and we refer to him as Pappy. And uh, then you see the, my two sons there, Ben on the left and Matt on the right. Uh, ben is in charge of all of the R&D for Uncle Matt's. He has a master's from UF in uh, horticultural science, and. Matt on the right is the CEO of Uncle Matt. And there is a, a nice picture. That is Matt, my uh, obviously Uncle Matt. Those are all my grandkids. I have 12 grandkids. All live right there in Claremont within 10 miles of my house. Nine granddaughters and three grandsons. Heavy on the hens and short on the roosters. <laughs> but luckily, it doesn't show a picture of my daughter in here. I have a daughter in between Ben and Matt, and I refer to her as my favorite daughter. <laughs> she has the three sons, the grandsons, so she is, she's number one in, in our family. So We were founded in 1999, 100% organic fresh fruit and juice company, family-owned and operated fourth-generation Florida citrus family located in Claremont. Largest organic grower, packer, shipper of organic fresh citrus in the Sunshine State. Organic is all we do, and I think Marty can back that up for us. Uncle Matt's Organic is the original and oldest organic OJ brand in the U.S. Okay, I'm going to just take a second to tell you, if you're going to be an organic citrus grower, corn grower, cotton, soybean, just go down the list. This is a book that I highly recommend. This is Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants. And we have a saying in our little company that minerals drive the bus. If you're going to be an organic grower, you have got to understand soil chemistry, physics, and biology. And you have to understand mineral nutrition. If you don't, you will not be successful. And I, I will put that in writing. And just look, right down there, I have an arrow over there on, the, on one of the chapters there. And just look there, I got to look. It says, relationship between mineral nutrition and plant disease and pest. Can you imagine that the minerals that's in that soil has a direct relationship with fungus and pest? Wow, what an eye opener. I was a con conventional grower for 40 years, and starting in 1999, we switched to organic, thanks to Matt, and this was a whole new learning procedure for me. I had never, uh, the never's not correct, but I had hardly ever studied new minerals in the soil and what they, how they affected what we're trying to do, whether we're increasing nutrient density or we are talking about pest control. And look at the, in that little chapter there, the very 11.6, direct and indirect effects of fertilizer applications on disease and pest. Wow. 
What an eye opener there. So we're going to go right on in to soil analysis. Uh, after I got out of the conventional and went into the organic arena, my dad, he graduated from U of F in 1939 with a degree in soils chemistry. He learned what we call the Albrecht soil balancing method. Dr. Albrecht from the University of Missouri. All the land grant universities in the US prior to World War II, they taught the Albrecht method of soil balancing. After World War II, a new president, new team, they changed and they went to what we call the pH method. My dad graduated in 39, learned the Albrecht method. I graduated in 65, I learned the pH method. <laughs> we fought, we fought, and we fought. And he always told me, he said, you're going to grow up to be an old, gray-headed, burned-out citrus grower if all you're going to do is chase pH. And that's what I learned was chasing pH. He learned all about base saturation percent of calcium and magnesium, okay? And that's the whole game right there. Once you understand that, soils over in Clermont, you know, maybe a 2% organic matter at best, maybe a four exchange, you have to understand that there is a relationship on base saturation percent of calcium and magnesium to make that soil work. Luckily, I met Neil Kinsey in the late 90s, and he taught this. He gives a course, Neil Kinsey, he's in Missouri, and he, give, he teaches this course. He studied under Dr. Albrecht, so he does about four or five seminars a year. We learned that, all my brothers, I'm the oldest of five boys, we're all in the citrus business. And once we learned that Albrecht method, my dad and I, it was, <laughs> it was amazing. It opened my eyes, I started learning things. All right, the biggest uh, problem we have now in the citrus industry in the state of Florida is, it's got three names, HLB, greening, and yellow dragon disease, but it's all the same thing. Okay, there's a little tiny insect. There she is. It's called a citrus psyllid. She's so tiny, you have to have a bug glass to see her, all right? Mm -hmm. And she carries a bacteria in her stomach, and it's the same game as the mosquito spreading malaria. She's a vector. She doesn't know she's doing it. And she's attracted to the citrus tree. She doesn't know a citrus tree from a telephone pole. Why is she attracted to my citrus tree? She's sourcing protein in the form of free, amino, of free amino acids that's in the sap, okay? Do I, how do I attract her more? How about using ammonium nitrate? That's peer-reviewed and published research. The levels of free amino acids just go out of the roof. She hones in on that. We don't know if it rings the bells, flashes the light, it's energy, we don't know, but that's how she locates it, she finds it, and she, injects the bacteria in, into the leaf, and the tree does not recognize the bacteria as a pathogen and does not turn on its own immune system and kill it right there. That's the big question in the whole citrus industry, whether you're conventional, organic, or abandoned. Nobody can figure out why that tree can't recognize it. This is how she looks when she's sucking the sap out of the citrus limbs there. You can, you can go into a grove if you're in the grove as much as I am. They're not hard to find. Okay, this is the, this is the big thing we learned from, you know, my dad used to teach all us boys, all science begins with observation. It's not the other way around. He beat that in our heads. He said, you've got to turn off the phone, turn off the radio, turn off the TV, get your butt in the truck, get out there in the grove. That's where the answers are. Okay, so what we started noticing that once we found this little wolf spider, she lives in the trees, she looks like the devil there, but she's really a friend, okay? And we noticed that wherever we found the, the silage, we found the little wolf spider, all right? So us being organic, obviously, we're not spraying any restricted pesticides that kills this spider. And lo and behold, we sent, we caught one, we sent them up to the lab in Gainesville. They cut open the stomach of the wolf spider and they found 
they quit counting over a thousand nymphs. Okay, the psyllid lays an egg. Oh, I missed it. But she lays an egg, it hatches, and it becomes a nymph. And the nymph walks around on, looks like a little tiny fish scale. Well, this wolf spider, she catches the nymph and she eats it. Okay, there's another friend. This is the crab spider. How is she a friend in the, in the grove? She has spider webs. She puts spider webs all in these trees. You see those spider webs? Well, the psyllid flies in there and they get caught in those webs. And interestingly, interestingly enough, we, we check with the entomologist, the crab spider does not eat the psyllid. All she does is she wraps them up. Oh, evidently, she doesn't like them either, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Okay, here is, now we're all, I'm, I keep referring back to how observation, okay, this is how you learn. We notice this is a, a little, a blue-green leaf notcher, and they're a big problem in the citrus industry. And what they do is they drop down on the ground, they burrow under the ground, and they eat the roots, and the root is now open to an infection, and we get a fungus in there. Well, we started noticing that every once in a while we'd find a leaf notcher that had that little look like a marshmallow, that like she'd sat in a marshmallow. So we sent it off to the lab, got it analyzed, and it's a fungus, okay? We found out that it's a bavarious fungus, so now we're actually promoting this fungus in our groves to control the little leaf notcher there. No pesticides. All right, guess what? This is a well-recognized weed in the citrus industry, all right? This is, this is lantana, and as a young boy growing up in the citrus industry, during the summers, I had a hoe. My dad turned me loose in the grove, hoe up all that lantana. It was an obnoxious weed. Everybody hated it. But guess what it does? The little tamarixia that we release, which is a parasitic wasp, okay, she feeds on this. This is what she feeds on. She actually finds the nymph. She lays an egg in the nymph, and the nymph hatches out. Here's the little tamarixia. This is, they come in this little jar. They're so tiny you need a bug glass to see them also. And you notice on the label it says 150 tamarixia, little parasitic wasps in there. I don't know who counts them, <laughs> but they guarantee there's 150 in there. But if you look real close, you can see little tiny ones up there by my finger. That's, that's how small they are. Well, they find the nymphs and they lay an egg in the nymph and the nymph doesn't hatch and we find, there's how we hang them in the grove, and I get it ever, uh, I get a shipment every seven days from the University of Florida up there. Okay, there's what she looks like, and that's the good guys now. She's a little old tiny parasitic wasp. She doesn't sting you, but she flies around, and that's all she does. She looks for the nymphs. There's how it starts out. The, the psyllid lays an egg. Okay, and now the egg hatches, and you see in 14 days it's a total nymph, and that's what the nymph looks like on the far right there, and that's where she starts laying the eggs in it. The one on the far right is parasitized. You see that the egg is already is starting to hatch in her, and there's what they look like, the nymph looks like when the egg hatches that the parasitic wasp laid and just leaves a big hole in them like that. So we actually have students that come from UF, and they go in and they count these, they take these little limbs back into the labs and they study them to see if the parasitic wasp is working. This is a, an example of a uh, organic pesticide that we use. And look at the label there. You'll see it's clove oil, sesame oil, rosemary oil, and thyme oil. Okay, and we, those, all four, they actually help in controlling the psyllids. They don't kill them, they don't wipe them out, but they keep them under control that we can, our biological control keeps it level. And we have the USDA comes in every 21 days and they do what we call tap counts. They have trees that they count every 21 days. They take a sticky pad on a, like a clipboard and they bang the limbs and the adult sill is dropped down and they count them. And they give us counts every 21 days of how we're doing organically compared to conventional 
and surprisingly, we are we're in the same range as the boys that spray over 21 days. So we're very excited about that. That you know we're holding our own. <laughs> We have been called the bad boys for a long time in the industry. The conventional boys blamed us for not controlling the silids and that, you know, we were letting them go through our grove and to the neighbors. But with these counts, you know, we said, look, <laughs> we're just as good as you guys. So we're not the bad boys. So. Yeah. We missed that. Oh, there it is. All right. <clears throat> this is an interesting picture here. This is. I just took, I took this picture last week. Marty, for your information, this is up in Lake City. Okay, this, this tree was planted in 1945, all right? Now it went through the 57 freeze, the 62 freeze, the 83 freeze, the 85 freeze, the 89 freeze. Look at it. You see me, I'm six foot tall, you see how high it is. It's never been fertilized, it's never been sprayed, it's never been herbicided, it's never been topped. It's, I mean, it's amazing. And look how strong it is, and it's still growing, and it withstood all of those freezes where all of Central Florida, right here where you're sitting right now, got wiped out in the 83-85 freeze. We lost 300,000 acres of bearing citrus right up here in Central Florida in the 83-85 freeze. That's in Lake City, which air miles is about 120 air miles north of here. If our low here was 17 degrees, the low there must have been 10, but it all survived. So there's a dead giveaway that it, everything that's happening in the citrus center is, is because of us, because that's never been touched, and you see it's still alive, surviving, producing fruit. As bad as greening is in the industry, that's what it looked like after the 83 freeze, that's a, gr a grapefruit grove that I owned, okay? Killed it deader than a hammer. Not one tree survived, and that was the Christmas Eve 1983 freeze. There's the worst freeze we've had since 1989, and you know, if you were at Vegas and you were betting on odds, you'd say, listen, 1989 was the last year we had a killer freeze, <laughs> you know, getting close. So normally if you look back on the history of the Florida citrus, about every seven years we've had a bad freeze if you average it out over the 150 years. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk, tell my little story. So thank you very much. What's your name? <laughs> Phil Stoddard. Phil? Yeah. Tell you a quick story. I did, after, the, after we all got wiped out in the freezes, I had 350 acres scattered all around. It killed every tree I had, dead in the hammer. So I took on a project in the Bahamas, worked down there for seven years, flew back and forth every weekend. And from there, I went to Costa Rica, and I worked in seven different countries in Central America doing consulting. One of the companies I worked for, Tico Fruit, uh, we ended up planting about 20,000 acres down there, all new land, nurseries, everything, and they had a full-time entomologist. And this was right when the psyllids population was starting in Florida, which was about eight or nine years ago, and everybody was like, what's, you know, what's going to happen, what's going to go on? Well, they had an entomologist that lived in the jungle. Okay, you, we actually went in a four-wheel drive out to the jungle, and he had a little pup tent. He was studying the psyllid, okay? So what he found out, that the host plant for the psyllid was what we call orange jasmine, okay? All right, so what he did is he took, uh, he took a 40-acre block, and he divided it into four 10-acre blocks. He planted, and orange jasmine is just like a little boxwood. It's, it's, you know, it's very small. It's not a big wild plant. The first 10 acres, he planted it in every middle. 
the next 10, every other middle, the next 10, every fourth middle, and the last 10, he did a hedge all the way around that 10 acres. Well, after studying it for two or three years, guess what? All of them worked, okay? And I literally walked through this stuff and I took pictures of it and you could straddle the little boxwood and the trees are of Valencia trees bearing full of flowers and you could do that and you see a little white cloud come up and they go right back in it, the psyllid. They weren't interested in the orange tree. What did he do to the jasmine? He fertilized it with the equivalent of 90 pounds of ammonium nitrate. And back then, Timic was allowed, okay, aldicarb, it's, it's no longer allowed. And they treated every row with a Timic. So as soon as the psyllid sucked the sap out of the orange jasmine, it killed her, okay? Never went into the orange tree. So they ended up with the fourth 10-acre block just making a hedge around it. And it worked. The psyllids never went into the citrus. Okay, so I'm all excited, boy. You know, I bring this information back. You know, so, man. So can, you, can you do it and still contain the, the insecticide so they don't get into the soil for your regular trees? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, you can plant it over there against the wall, and this would be your first row of citrus, you know, because they are attracted. They're sourcing protein. And that's, once you fertilize it, it goes sky high. Have you done it? Huh? Have you done it? <laughs> well, you know, I came back with all this information and I was all excited, you know. So I go to uh, our research center and I share this information with about five PhDs. And I'm like, man, guess what? This is how simple it's going to be. Okay. So I give the whole present, little presentation. And anyway, about 30 days later, my office is in Claremont. I'm walking into Home Depot to the in the ornamental section over there, big sign right there. You know, you, you, I can't even get around it. It says, warning, notice, orange jasmine, parentheses Mariah, that's what it's called, is outlawed in the state of Florida. <laughs> you cannot buy, sell, grow, even have seeds. Florida Department of Ag. I'm like, I can't believe this. What is going on? Make a phone call. Boys, I just saw this sign. Oh, uh, Mr. McLean, man, I'm glad you called. Said uh, uh, what we found out, and that was a great presentation. But what we found out is the orange jasmine is a host to the bacteria. I said, wait, wait a minute. They explain. What do you mean a host to the bacteria? Well, the bacteria lives in the orange jasmine. It lives in there. So anytime that psyllid comes in there, you know. She's going to either put it in there or take it out, and it's going to be there year-round. You know, and, I, <laughs> it's, and it's a joke around my family because I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. i got a grove. I can see it out my office window. It's 60 acres, 150 trees to an acre. That's 9,000 trees. I said, i got 9,000 trees that are host to the bacteria. Am I right? You know, well, yeah, we knew you wouldn't understand, but, you know, this, <laughs> anyway, it got outlawed. Okay, it's illegal to do anything with orange jasmine now. So just blow that off and now come back to the reality, okay, how do you do it conventionally or organic? You know, and obviously nobody is successful today because the whole entire state of Florida is infected with green. <laughs> Except that tree that I showed you there. <laughs> it doesn't have it. It doesn't have it, so. Any more questions? <laughs> How does, do you think the Chinese uh, introduced the, uh, or no, I mean, it's a silly question, introduced that as a, as a weapon to wipe out our citrus industry so they can dominate the world's citrus industry? <laughs> <laughs> or was it just an accident? You know, I, I work with these guys. I'm friends with these guys. Okay, I, I don't know. It, it's, it was very, uh, very confusing and very... Uh, uh, it hurt my pride. You know, I couldn't figure out why we couldn't use something like that. And, and now, since then, and this happened about seven or eight years ago, since then, we've done a little studying on the Mariah plant, okay, the orange jasmine, and 
come to find out that when you isolate the jasmine and no psyllids can get to it, it has the ability to clean itself up and it kills the bacteria. All right, so now our thinking was why couldn't you, if that's, if that's true, and orange jasmine is a cousin to citrus, all right? It, there's a linkage in there. So we, th we thought, being organic, man, if that's true, why can't we now take, put the orange jasmine in a, in a grove and get the psyllids to come in there and she sucks out that sap, all right, and now she transfers that sap to my orange tree and it turns on the immune system because that's what it's doing in the orange jasmine. So now we use the psyllid as a vector for us moving the good out into the grove. But anyway, you know, my, my dad always referred to what I'm ex sharing with you guys and everything. We just called it crackerology in the family. So, you know, that's all it's worth. So anyway, it's still, it's still outlawed. So unfortunately. He didn't, get a question. he didn't get your answer to his question, which was, do you think it was a Chinese plot to introduce the Asian, the Asian citrus psyllid? <laughs> I, I didn't want to answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a politician. Yeah, very well done. Very well done. Um, <laughs> any other, we got time for one more minute. Why is Uncle Ben's organic juices, why are they so delicious? They are. They're very delicious. Why, why is that so? That's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> Marty will give you your check on the way out. <laughs> uh, we, we like to claim that it's all about nutrient density. Okay, go back to the minerals nutrition. Minerals drive the bus. It's all about nutrient density. Now, can, can we put that on the label? Oh, no. No way. You won't ever, all you got to do is taste it, and, but you'll never see it on the label. So. Well, thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you.